Greetings, I am Nicholas Moran. You may know me by my internet nom de guerre of The Chieftain. Uh, one of the reasons I picked that name was because of the Chieftain tank. First tank I ever drove. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it is my favorite tank. But Nicholas, I'll hear you cry. You're doing this wrong. You're supposed to start with your number five and work your way up to number one. Well, let me explain to you why my favorite tank is not in my list of top five tanks. You see, when the Tank Museum asked me to come on and do one of their top fives, I'm honored, I want to do a good job for them. So I email Roz and say, hey, what are your criteria that you want me to judge these top five by? No criteria, just pick five. And as I thought about it, I realized she had a point. Because if you pick a criterion, let's say the best tank ever, everybody with a lick of sense will pick Centurion as number one, and that'll be the end of it. Where's the fun? Now, other people who know my uh, videos will realize that I put great emphasis on ergonomics. How well can a crew get the most out of their vehicle? They've got 200 plus vehicles here. I can't get into them all, I don't have the time. So I can't give you a good assessment there either. Besides, picking a criterion, it says, I have to tell 195 of my children that I don't love them as much as the other five on some random arbitrary measure. So that's a non-starter. So what I decided to do is I'm gonna go on influence and impact. What effect has a tank had on the battlefield or on the world? And even at that, getting it down to just five tanks ain't easy. So after much reflection, I've decided I'm gonna start with my number five as the S tank. What, what do you mean your, your number five? This is my fifth favorite tank. I've already picked it. This is my fifth favorite tank. Go on, pick your own, clear off. Uh, this isn't easy. Cheek of it. This is my <laughs> fifth favorite tank, this is. It is said that there is nothing on the modern battlefield more dangerous than a man with a map, a radio, a pair of binoculars, who knows how to use them. It is also said that there is nothing more dangerous than a second lieutenant with a map and a radio, although I think that one might actually be in jest. Regardless, I thought I would actually start the top five list by picking a vehicle that was coming a little to you out of left field and unexpected, or at least I thought it would until it was mentioned in Chris Barry's list. But to represent this critically important and underappreciated battlefield task, I've gone with my number five vehicle, the Scimitar, one of the CVRT or the Scorpion family. Yes, it's not technically a tank, I got it, although some countries did use their Scorpions as light tanks. But for the tactical task of being sneaky and seeing the enemy, I don't think a better reconnaissance vehicle has been made than the Scimitar. For starters, it's not too big. It's not conspicuous. Remember, you don't want the enemy to know that you have been seen. It carries the radio and it does it quickly because you've got that Jaguar engine. I mean, how cool is it to have a Jaguar engine? Okay, they changed it out to a diesel later, but still, it's the, the point. With this basic information, you now tell your major combat forces, those impressive main battle tanks and IFVs that everybody associates with ground power, where to apply it. Without that critical need to know information of where to go, all the combat power in the world is useless. So um, as a cavalryman myself, I am quite appreciative of the task that reconnaissance does. The vehicle is not heavily armed, it doesn't need to be. The 30 millimeter Rodin on this is not a new weapon. It comes with three round clips and a little hand crank to move the rounds into position. But it is enough to get itself out of trouble. If a BRDM comes around the corner or maybe a BMP, you can engage it, probably destroy it. Either way, you can get away. And that's all you need to do as a reconnaissance vehicle. This isn't a tank. It is not designed to go up in the front line of combat, unless maybe you're using it as an ersatz tank in the Falklands. So for these reasons, I would argue that the number five scimitar is well justified, if perhaps a little unexpected. I can talk about the M4 for hours, and indeed on my various videos and articles, I do so. So I'm not gonna really bore you with that here. It is a very controversial tank. I'd like to think that uh, folks like Steve Zaloga and myself have started a bit of a rehabilitation of the M4, but there's still a lot of misconceptions and perhaps not entire truths going around. 
So, Mr. Barry, if you're watching this, we need to sit down over a pint and have a discussion on your opinion on the M4. There are two different levels to looking at the M4. The tactical side, a lot of people think about. It's a case of how effective is the tank at putting steel on target, be it high explosive, be it armor piercing, at getting to where it needs to be and having a battlefield effect. Now in this, I strongly believe that the M4 is underrated. People will focus on the wrong things. So, oh, the M4 was useless until the British put the 17 pounder into it. Well, I have my own opinions on the Firefly, and I think that this is actually a better tank if not necessarily a better tank killer. But what is the purpose of the tank? But to do everything on the modern battlefield as part of a combined arms force. And to this, the M476, I think they did a very, very good job. High rate of fire, good traverse, good optics, not necessarily in terms of the clarity, but the gunner in this can see outside very well. He's got a stabilizer what other tanks had stabilizers. So this means that you can observe a target from a complete turret down position, advance forward, and engage very quickly. And since the man who fires first will usually win, having that advantage of surprise is very important. But there is another part of this which is at the slightly higher level. Now, for example, imagine you were standing next to me, and I asked you to point to the most important part of the tank. The chances are you will not point to the same part that I do. My answer for the most important part of this tank is this little piece of metal here, which most people will completely look past and ignore unless they're making a model of their Sherman and they snip it off of the sprue and it goes flying and it lands in the carpet and you're now looking for it on your hands and knees for the next 20 minutes. Ask me how I know. And I bet you a lot of people will find this problem familiar. The reason being is that, of course, American tanks were not produced anywhere near the war zone. Everything had to be shipped thousands of miles to different theaters. And no other tank saw service in every theater of war. The Matildas came close, but I don't believe they were in the China, Burma, India theater. Shermans would be found from the tropics of the South Pacific, to the frozen tundras of the Soviet Union. So a German tank didn't really have to worry about the logistical train getting to Kwajalein. They certainly didn't have to worry about whether or not the humid water effects in the tropics had any deterious effect on the tank itself. So for example, in the US archives, there are boxes and boxes of materials on what happens to rubber in the South Pacific or where is the wiring in the tank. If it, is, it turns out, if you have the wiring at the bottom of the tank, your tank will not necessarily work. This tank worked everywhere. And it was repairable, and it didn't break down much, which meant that you didn't have to transport your spare parts in the same volume all the way across the water. I was talking with an Israeli chap once, and he observed that the Israelis did not claim that the Merkava was the best tank in the world. They claimed it was the best tank in the world for Israel. And that argument, I think, applies just as well to the M4. You can make an argument what was the best tank of World War II. I will listen to you say T-34. I will listen to you say Panzer IV, whatever. You can give or take. But what was the best tank in the world for the US military in World War II? As part of that fighting force traveling all over the globe, as a combined arms fighting force that had artillery and infantry all communicating well together. To that, I think the M4 does meet that requirement. And for its sheer impact for going everywhere in the world, and including a good post-war career, the Sherman becomes the number four in my top five list. My number three tank presents us with a problem. It is the M1 Abrams, and the tank museum doesn't actually have one. So, Fort Benning, get on it, please. But why would I pick the M1? Well, I will be the first to admit that there is a little bit of personal bias here. I'm a US Army armor officer. I served on Abrams. I took one with me to Iraq for a year. It did everything I asked of it. Fantastic tank. But perhaps more importantly, it is representative of the modern generation of MBT. So in this case, a Challenger II. 
And unlike earlier generations of tanks, there is a lot more international communication in terms of tank design and standardization. By way of example, take my tank in Iraq. It was barely legal. Not really, that was its name, barely legal. And you would describe it as having a German gun, British armor, American engine and radios, Belgian machine guns, Italian sidearms, and an Irish commander. Everybody is talking with everybody else. You get the, basically the difference is more in the details than it is the overall tank design. And even more important than the details, the crewmen inside them. The M1, the Leopard 2, pick one. They are all actually very old designs. Uh, the basic Leopard 2 came out, what, 79? You have generations of people that have father and son, and maybe now even grandkid, could all have served on the same type of tank. Incredible longevity. These are the tanks that defined the end of the Cold War and the start of the post-Cold War period, and they will be in the inventory for decades yet to come, even in first world nations. And that shows you just how fundamentally outstanding these designs have become. But function is starting to merge with form. The tanks today, is there really a huge difference between them? Okay, yes, you will have some people will point out some advantages that one tank has over another tank. Uh, but really, okay, it's a lot easier to tension the track on the Challenger 2 compared to the M1. I mean, okay, the M1, the way you tension a track, it takes you 15 minutes, it involves swinging a grease gun around your head, getting very muddy, realizing that you're out of grease, go over to your tank, get another grease pad out, shove it in, realize that you've got it now all over your hands, give it a couple of test squeezes, you now squirted your gunner, who's now very angry at you, swing it around your head a few more times, continue squeezing until finally you have your track tension, close up the track skirt. Challenger 2, the driver has a button. Well, actually, I think it's a lever just above them. But uh, oh, that's a little around for people that know my tendency to go on about track tension in my videos. But outside of that, a modern MBT is a multinational conglomeration of roughly comparable value. What else is there to say? The T-55, I would say, is a very, very close runner-up for the title of best tank design ever. But that's not why it's number two on my list. Instead, it is for sheer impact value. I would like to consider this sort of the Toyota Hilux of tanks. These things will be kept running forever. They built so many of them to start with, they were exported widely, and now in every bush war you can come up with anywhere on the planet, that chances are a T-55 will be found there. It is just so fundamentally a good design. The 100 millimeter rifle was excellent for its time. It's rock reliable. The armor was good. It was so good that it took one of these things driving into the embassy in Hungary before they realized in NATO that they needed a bigger gun, hence the L7. So for, perhaps for that reason, we should thank the Soviets because that did give us that fantastic NATO gun. It just shows up everywhere. You cannot come up with a tank that has the same level of ubiquity and presence as the T-55. So on that basis, short, nothing much else to say, number two. And so we come to my number one tank. The tank that I think has had more impact on the world of tankdom than any other tank. And it is the diminutive little Renault FT. Now in today's world, battlefields swarming with Abrams and Leopards and all the other modern marvels of warfare, the FT really isn't all up to all that much. I mean, optics, what optics? Communications, we don't need any. Traverse, hmm, manpower. This is as basic as a basic tank gets. But remember when they were building this, nobody knew what a tank was supposed to look like. And yet we have driver up front, 360 degree rotating turret in the middle, power system at the back with the engine and sprocket wheel at the rear on a fully tracked chassis. The influence of this tank can be seen on basically every tank which followed over the next 100 years. And as a result, the FT is my number one. Now here's a little bit of trivia for you. The U.S. Army's armor branch insignia is two cavalry sabers with a tank superimposed on them. That tank 
and M26 Pershing. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and support them on Patreon. I'm Nicholas Morin, also known as The Chieftain from World of Tanks Wargame. You can find some more of my material by searching for The Chieftain's Hatch or on YouTube inside The Chieftain's Hatch. Those were my top five. Thanks for watching.